the summer session of, of general psychology. I think it's called general psychology, or maybe it's introduction to psychology. Introduction to psychology, that's what we call it at Diné College. <laughs> I've been teaching this class for over 30 years, and everybody changes the name. Not important, not important. Uh, so one of the questions you may be asking yourself, that you probably asking lots of questions. What in the world's going on here? Uh, let me show you how to pass the class. Uh, this is it, the course requirements. This is all on your uh, Blackboard page, um, fairly close to the top. Uh, so the course requirements, there will be chapter quizzes, 15 points for each chapter. I think there's 13 chapters. I don't know. I don't remember. Wait a minute. You can divide that out and you can figure it out yourself. Um, 16 chapters. Uh, there's a library paper that you will have to do worth 100 points. Uh, there are discussion questions. And the discussion questions, uh, you will not be able to find the answers in the book. Uh, they are questions that uh, delve into what you're thinking. And that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for your thoughts. And as long as you put down your thoughts, then you will do fine on the discussion questions. I do not, I do not uh, grade content. Uh, I just want to know what you're thinking. Uh, so there you go. Those, those are the requirements. It adds up to 500 points. Uh, so if you score over 450 points, uh, then uh, that will be an A, and uh, on, on and on and on. Okay, so if you need to talk to me about anything, something's happened, you don't like the way that uh, I'm lecturing, something else is going on, uh, you can always get a hold of me uh, on Monday and Tuesday between 3 and 5 at this address. This is a Zoom address. Uh, it's always the same, or on Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, between 8 and 10 in the morning uh, at the same address. Okay, so those are my office hours. I have eight hours at each week. One of the great things about this class is that uh, there is no, the textbook is online and it's right here. It's, it's a free textbook from Rice University. And if you click on that, it will take you to OpenStax and there you go. That's it. Psychology Second Edition. And you can look at the table of contents, and you can go wherever you need to go for all the chapters. Isn't that great? You don't have to pay for a textbook. You're welcome. Uh, actually, Professor Barber is the one that uh, discovered this book, so he's the hero. Okay, so there is your textbook. And the syllabus is right here. So if you have any questions about anything, this is me. I'm Dr. Bruce M. Bradway. Uh, I live in Lost Nation, Iowa, um, and I've been here since COVID started. So I am home at my home anyway. And if you wonder where Lost Nation, uh, Iowa is, uh, look at Chicago on the map and go directly west. And as soon as you, you uh, enter Iowa, uh, then you're then you're in Lost Nation. Uh, tiny little town. We live on a farm. Uh, actually, they're they're growing corn on in, in the two fields to our north and, and to our south. So we will be buried in corn. So if you're claustrophobic, <laughs> by the by the end of the summer, we're going to be uh, corn corn stalks uh, in this part of the world uh, grow to about. Uh, eight to ten feet, so we're going to be covered in corn. It's very green here, almost as green as Ireland. So, so there you go. And all the information you need to know. There is the class schedule: week one, week two, week three, week four, and on and on. on. Today we're going to cover. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to cover uh, chapters one and two. So, we really actually need to get going need to get our cells in gear here. Um, okay, so if you have any other questions, uh, when do you need to have your library paper done? Okay, here's, here's the deal between you and me. Uh, I do not count off for late work. Um, the reason I don't is because a lot of things happen. Uh, sometimes things beyond your control. You may be planning on spending, you know, uh, lots and lots of time 
uh, on this class because, oh, it's so much fun. Uh, but uh, things happen. And uh, because things happen, uh, COVID, uh, kids get sick, uh, the car breaks down, uh, you lose your Wi-Fi, you never know what's going to happen. Because of all of these uh, uh, potential crises, uh, I do not count off for late work. And uh, I know everybody else does. Uh, I'm not much of a, of a timekeeper. You just have to have everything done by the end of the semester. And the end of the semester is the 4th of August. So probably I need to have the all the... Uh, I need to turn in grades the following Monday, and that would be the 7th of August. I'll have to have all the grades in. So you need to have your stuff in by the 4th of August. Okay, there is no final in this, uh, in this uh, uh, class. Uh, I just have chapter quizzes. So once you're done with the chapter quiz and you've answered your discussion question, you're done with the chapter, okay? And like I said, today we're going to cover two chapters. I hope that covers everything. If you have any other questions, uh, shoot me an email. Uh, my email address, wait a minute. My email address is on here, right there. There it is, right there. That's me. Uh, and I'll be glad to answer any of your questions. If you need any help with anything, uh, don't hesitate to ask. If you can't uh, be at, at my office hours between uh, 3 and 5 on Monday and Tuesday or 8 to 10 on Wednesday and Thursday, make an appointment. Just tell me when you can meet and, and I can meet. Um, I don't have anything else to do, I don't think. My grandson's going to be in Florida with his, with his father. I'll probably go into my grandson <laughs> over, over the... This summer we'll talk about my grandson. So uh, anyway, he'll be, he's 10 years old. He's in the fifth grade. Uh, he graduates from the fifth grade on on Thursday, the 25th. So I have to be there to see him walk across the stage and go to the junior high school, which seems a little odd to me. Uh, when I was in school, uh, how old am I? I'm 73 years old. I'll tell you right now, I'm 73. So uh, when I was in the fifth grade, that would be in uh, 55, uh, 1960, I guess. Is that right? Okay. Uh, yeah, 1960. Uh, we didn't graduate from one place to the other. <laughs> we just went to the went to the school. Anyway, not important. Not important. Not important. Uh, we'll get uh, so we'll get started, I guess. Chapter one, I like pictures. So you're going to see a lot of pictures. If you see any that offend you, uh, please tell me and I'll take them out. Uh, don't tell the provost. Uh, she's already <laughs> yelled at me once. <laughs> so we don't, I don't need to be yelled at again. Uh, anyway, introduction to psychology, chapter one. Um, the introduction is going to talk about all the different types of psychology that we have, all the different areas of psychology that you can study. It's really kind of fun. So what is psychology? It's the study of mental processes. Uh, as a science, it covers lots of stuff, and we're going to go into it right now. It studies the, it uh, covers the nervous system. Um, so if you are interested in the nervous system, I was just talking to somebody who is finishing their PhD and they want to they want to do postdoc work in uh, in the nervous system. Uh, sensation and perception. This would be cognitive psychology. Uh, learning and memory. That would also be cognitive psychology, probably. Intelligence. Um, and of course, I have a picture of Einstein. I thought his his IQ was 160, but People have been saying lately that it was over 180, so very intelligent man. Uh, language, different languages. You guys have a language. English is a language, of course. Uh, Spanish, if you know anybody from south of the border. Most of south of the border. Actually, there is a country in South America that doesn't speak Spanish. They speak Portuguese, which is very similar to uh, to Spanish. Not important. Thought. 
Uh, growth and development, human growth and development, that's always exciting. And we, and we will cover a chapter. Most of these cover chapters in the book. Uh, personality, different personalities. And if you look at these guys, you're thinking, oh, I know she's got a different personality from her and from her and from him and from him. Uh, anyway. Uh, stress and health, uh, and this is actually a picture of me. Uh, this is this is actually my third uh, uh, reservation to work on. I, I worked at uh, Fort Belknap, which is up in Montana, up on the Canadian border, for 10 years. This is actually at Fort Belknap, and these are the uh, the natives that live there. Not him. He's, he's white. Not him. He's Puerto Rican. But uh, she's, she is, uh, uh, what is she? I think she's um, Grovant or uh, Ani. Uh, and he's Nakoda. And he's Nakoda. Well, it's hard to tell. I can't really see people's faces. <laughs> but here I am. I, I, I uh, uh, lost in a um, uh, mud volleyball tournament. And these were my buddies. And we made a bet: whoever lost had to do push-up, twenty-five push-ups in the in the uh, mud. So that's me doing push-ups in the mud. Psychological disorders, of course, abnormal psychology. <clears throat> uh, sexual behavior. Uh, we teach a class in human sexual behavior. Uh, Professor Barber teaches that. Uh, social behavior. That would be social psychology. Uh, psych majors that have made it good. Uh, this is uh, Mark Zuckerberg. He's the creator of Facebook, one of the richest men in the world. That doesn't mean just because you're a psychology major, you will be a rich person. Uh, the John Stewart, who's a TV personality, he was also a psych major. Uh, Natalie Portman, one of the more attractive women of the world is a psych major as well. Uh, Amy Farrah Fowler of the Big Bang Theory or Mayim Bilek has a PhD in neuroscience. Uh, okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, uh, psychology. It's, it's really kind of interesting because uh, I uh, did a lot of my uh, doctorate at uh, Indiana University and uh, to, in order to find the psychology texts at the uh, Indiana University library you have to go up to the fourth floor and the fourth floor is the philosophy floor or the floor that covers philosophy. So before psychology was considered a science it was considered a philosophy. The ancient Greeks acknowledged psychology but more as a philosophy of the mind, the idea. They we, they really couldn't prove anything, so it was more of a, uh, it was just an idea. It wasn't until the 19th century that physicians realized that certain illnesses were caused by maladjusted mental processes and could, could be improved through talking therapy, and this was uh, Freud. Now, Freud wasn't the first one that, that that started the talking therapies, but Freud was the one that popularized it. So Sigmund Freud is is very uh, is uh, seen as one of the fathers of psychology. At the same time, scientists were investigating the processes, the process of thinking. Uh, there were different uh, individuals that were looking at the science of of perception and sensation. And, of course, they were trying to make it a science. He was dealing with people that had uh, problems, that had uh, abnormal behavior. Freud was looking at abnormal behavior. Other people were looking at the, the, uh, the scientific stru structure of the idea of psychology. In 1873, in Leipzig, Germany, Wilhelm Wundt uh, published The Principles of Physiological Psychology, a book that described his findings from experiments on human conscious processes. He was one of the scientists. Wundt felt that he could identify components that combined uh, to create conscious experience. And that's Wilhelm Wundt. That rocket ship isn't really coming out of his head. It just happens to be in that, in that place. 
Vunt, this is Vunt right here. We just saw him young, when he was younger. Uh, he's got dark hair here, and he's got white hair here. Vunt built the, first, built the first psychological laboratory and constructed experiments around mechanical stimuli, such as puffs of air and subtle sounds. He reported them uh, through introspection or internal perception. Did you, did you feel anything? Did you uh, hear anything? Uh, this direction and form of inquiry became known as the structuralism and became dominant in Europe. So one of one of the things that's happening that will be happening is that uh, the European psychology starts out one way and American psychology starts out a totally different way. At the same time, Wundt was puffing air in people's faces. One of the great thinkers of American academia was going in a different direction. William James of Harvard University saw Wundt's view of chopped up sensations as not representative of the human mind. James felt that through introspection, the human mind was fluid and continuous, not chopped, chop, chopped up into little sections. And of course, we have a, <laughs> a rocket ship coming out of James's head as well. <laughs> The interesting thing, this was a brilliant family, the James family. Uh, there was an author, a very famous author, who was his brother. And I'm trying to think of his name. Henry James. Henry James. So he, he, wrote, he wrote books that are still popular to this day. Uh, the Rocking Horse Winner is one of them. Uh, that's the only one that comes to my mind. I was an English major. Uh, my undergraduate degree is in English, so... I had to read uh, Henry James. James's theory uh, sought to explain how we interact with our environment and how humans cope and develop habits. Because it looked at the human mind as a me mechanism of change and adaptation, his school of thought was labeled the functionalist school. So we have the structuralists in, in Europe and we have the functionalists in uh, the United States. Uh, so why in the world would, the, that would uh, people in the United States be looking for functionalism and their answer is because they were trying to increase pr productivity the profit has always been very very important in the united states now if you think about it in the 19th century most of europe were uh controlled by royal houses uh so there was they were that that was their political structure in the united states of course uh we were controlled by uh, a, a democratic idea, and of course, profit is part of that. Is part of that uh, that democratic idea. Well, these schools of thought deal primarily with philosophy and research of psychology. Physicians were dealing with patients who were incapacitated by mental problems that were not physical in nature. They needed to help to cure their patients in the form of counseling. The father of counseling psychology, of course, was Sigmund Freud. And this is a picture of Freud. He was Austrian. Uh, Wundt was German. Uh, and James, of course, was from the United States. The counseling technique developed by Freud was known as psychoanalysis, analyzing the psyche, analyzing the mind. <clears throat> One of the major problems during the 19th century was a diagnosis of hysteria, where the patient showed physical symptoms and emotional disturbances without a physical cause. Freud felt that these problems stemmed from a problem in the patient's unconscious. He felt that our experiences as an infant and child affected our behavior in the present. Freud uh, hypothesized that the basic drive for humans was a sexual drive, that began at birth and influenced the way infants and toddlers deal with the world. So Freud was thinking, well, what, what in the world is causing these problems? And at the same time, the structuralists are saying, I don't care. And the functionalists were saying, I don't care either. But Freud was saying, you know, we need to get to the bottom of this so that we can fix this. We, can, we need to be able to fix these people. So why, why was sex so important in the 19th century? Well, if you don't understand what was happening in the 19th, six, six, in the 19th century, the Victorian era, uh, it was a very sexually repressed time. And that may be one of the reasons why Freud was discovering that sex was so important. 
sex was so important because people uh, tried not to think about it. They changed. They changed the names of things. They they didn't. Uh, uh, they didn't take their clothes off. It was not a time. They had no idea what people looked like underneath their clothes. People wore clothes that uh, covered them, and no one had an idea what anybody looked like without their clothes on. <clears throat> Freud felt that most of our unpleasant or socially improper ideas are repressed into our unconscious and can only escape through slips of the tongue and dreams. Freud felt that humans are controlled by these unwanted sexual thoughts and they are constantly repressing them. They're trying to force them back into their minds because society doesn't want them to do this. And that is the society of the, uh, of the 19th century. Repressed, and, and the, this is known as repressed sexuality. Uh, people were, didn't want to think about anything that, uh, that had to do with sex. For a modern look at Freud, many psycho psychologists have found fault with some of his earlier theories. However, other psychologists point out that the basic premise behind his theories are sound and still widely accepted. His older theories are based on a European culture of 150 years ago. As I said, he was, he was dealing with Victorian Europe uh, that, was ve that was very sexually repressed. And because of that, his theories are based on only what he knew, and what he knew was a repressed, sexually repressed society. And because of that, that's where his theories came from. So it would be ridiculous for us to, to assume that everything, that humanity never changes. And it, because it, it really has changed. If you just look at the clothes, they certainly have changed. Women used to wear bustles. Bustles were, were, were structures that they wore on the back sides of themselves to make their, uh, so that you wouldn't know uh, what their, their butts looked like, as weird as that may seem. Why would they do that? Well, they did that because they didn't want anybody to know what their what their fannies look like. <laughs> I I know I'm laughing about this, but uh, I'm I'm just thinking that uh, as as I you know the last time I went to Walmart, everybody was walking in in yoga pants, and uh, so you know, that's the opposite of bustles is yoga pants. So we can see it that way. Uh, so Freud was dealing with bustles, and of course, a Freudian would be dealing with yoga pants today. <laughs> In the 1930s, three German psychologists fleeing Nazi Germany came to the United States and established the idea that the sum of great was greater than its parts, and this is known as Gestalt. So psychology is putting things together. Now there are um, as you put all these pieces together, you're not going to come up with a, with a total. Uh, what you're going to come in up with is a partial. But Gestalt tells you that our mind is greater than all these little pieces that we try to put together to, uh, to understand what the mind looks like. Uh, these three individuals were Wertheimer, Kafka, and Kuhler. Uh, they found structuralism is too limiting. Uh, they wanted to consider stimulus and response from the point of view of all factors. And that was these three individuals. Now the strange thing is these were three German scientists. They were all Jewish and because they were Jewish the uh, the uh, uh, Nazi party in, uh, in Germany um, uh, repressed them and because of that they fled Germany so that they wouldn't be uh, executed. Uh, they th Strangely they were all soldiers from World War One, and that's where they uh, became, uh, when they became psychologists. Gestaltists believe that perception is accomplished by integrating separate stimuli into meaningful patterns and taking these pieces to make a whole. A good example of this would be an optical illusion that people see as completed, though the pieces don't fit together completely. In other words, this you might see these as a square, but the reality is they're just lines. But because these pieces are here, you see this as, as these pieces on top of a square. But the reality is it's just four lines. And this is what Gestalt is all about. You see this as a whole. Oops, here we go. Uh, so what do you see here? Do you see a triangle in this picture? 
if you do, then you're looking at it incorrectly because these are three Pac-Men, uh, and you're probably too young to have ever played Pac-Man. <laughs> anyway, if you see that as a triangle, then that is part of Gestalt. Uh, this is just a series of spots, but if you can see a dog right here, a uh, retriever, uh, yeah, it's a hunting dog, then uh, that's Gestalt. As the 20th century began, Russian gastroenterologist Ivan Pavlov was discovering that he could get a dog to salivate when he introduced the bell sound. He had conditioned the dog to salivate. This experiment proved that a reflex could be learned the basic premise behind classical conditioning and behaviorism. So he could teach that dog that they needed, that, uh, that potentially he was going to feed them if he rang the bell. And because he, rang, because he rang the bell, the dog salivated whether he got the food or not, because he thought he was going to get the food. Watson felt that psychology had no real way of dealing with what was going on in the mind, and that the only important aspect that could be studied was what could be measured. And this was observed behavior. That's what he wanted to see. He wanted to see observed behavior. This school of thought became known as behaviorism. So we have structuralism, we have functionalism, functionalism, we have Freudian psychoanalysis, uh, we have Gestalt, which is looking at the pieces and, and uh, creating a whole from it, and now we have behaviorism. Behaviorism dominated experimental psychology for several decades and influences research till this day. Behaviorism is responsible for establishing psychology as a scientific discipline with its objective methods and experimentation. Now, the interesting thing is I started studying psychology in the 1970s, and behaviorism was still extremely powerful back then. So if you wanted to do any experiments, you needed to uh, use uh, be behaviorist um, uh, philosophy or, or theories uh, in order to do your your research. So if we look back at the at the 1950s, we look back at the 60s and 70s and 80s, we can see that research has changed over time, and we're going we're going to be seeing this as we uh, as we deal with psych more and more with psychology. Behavior modification continues to use uh, to be used, especially in behavioral and cognitive behavioral therapy. And cognitive behavioral therapy is the premier therapy right now. It's the one that most people use, cognitive behavioral therapy. They just want to change your behavior. They don't want to change your understanding of what your problem is. Uh, psychotherapy, that's what they look, that's psych psychoanalysis. They were, they wanted to find out what your, where your problem came from so that they could uh, convince you not to, to, to think about those kinds of things anymore not to, uh, uh, to think about it as, as if you were still a child. B.F. Skinner felt that he could control someone's behavior through rewarding and punishing. This Skinner called uh, operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is especially effective in training animals, and that's probably if you've ever uh, uh, watched an, an elephant uh, playing volleyball or basket or a raccoon playing basketball if they were trained using uh, be, uh, behavior modification or operant conditioning the skinner box is a chamber that isolates the subject from the external environment and has a behavior indicator such as a lever or a button when the animal pushes the button or the lever the box is able to deliver a positive reinforcement of the behavior such as food or a punishment such as a noise or a token conditioner, such as a light, that is correlated with either the positive reinforcement or punishment. And this is what a Skinner box looks like. During the early 20th century, American psychology was dominated by behaviorism and psychoanalysis. However, some psychologists were uncomfortable with what they viewed as limited perspectives being so influential in the field. They objected to the pessimism and determinism, all actions driven by the unconscious, of Freud. They also disliked the reductionism or simplifying of nature uh, that, uh, that represented behaviorism. 
Behaviorism is also deterministic at its core because it sees human behavior as entirely determined by a combination of genetics and environment. And uh, Freud felt that, uh, that all people were flawed and therefore they need to, needed to be fixed. And so did, so did Watson and so did Skinner. And that's, that's behaviorism and psychoanalysis. Some psychologists began to form their own ideas about that emphasize personal control, intentionality, and a true, true predisposition for good as important for self-concept uh, and our behavior. Both Freud and Skinner and Watson uh, felt that uh, people needed to be controlled, and that's one of the reasons why they came up with behaviorism and conditioning people, and that's one of the reasons why uh, Freud... Uh, came up with uh, some of the theories that he came up with, he felt that people were bad and needed to be controlled to be good. And, of course, from this concept that people are actually good and it's society that is bad, came this concept of humanism. Humanism is a perspective within psychology that emphasizes the potential for good that is innate to all humans, or the idea that if you leave somebody alone and society doesn't mess with them, that this individual will become a good person. Two of the most well-known proponents of humanistic psychology are Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers. Now, when I was uh, studying psychology in the 1970s, uh, I studied uh, Carl Rogers. And the reason I studied Carl Rogers was because that was... Uh, the popular method of, uh, of uh, therapy of, of the time was Rogerian therapy. So I am a Ro uh, Rogerian uh, using Egan's model. <laughs> that is the technique I was trained on uh, back in the 1970s. I graduated with a master's degree in psychology in 1979. Abraham Maslow was an American psychologist best known for proposing a hierarchy of human needs in motivating behavior. Maslow asserted that so long as basic needs necessary for survival were met, such as food, water, and shelter, and higher level needs, uh, social needs, uh, would begin to motivate behavior. But before you start uh, worrying about social needs, first of all, you need to make, take care of food, water, and shelter. According to Maslow, the highest level needs relate to self-actualization, a process by which we achieve our full potential. And of course, when we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we have the physical needs on the bottom, uh, the safety needs come next, the, the love and belonging needs are next, and then self-esteem, and eventually we have self-actualization. But if the needs below uh, self-actualization are not met, then self-actualization uh, is unnecessary because you got to sleep, you got, you've got to excrete, you've got to drink water or drink some liquid, uh, you need to breathe. And according to, well, sex is one of the physical needs, of course. And the, this is this is Carl Rogers, and this is Abraham Maslow. Now, the interesting about thing, well, the interesting thing to me about Carl Rogers is that he's he's from up around Chicago, which is like two hundred miles east of where I am. Uh, Abraham Maslow was a, uh, was from New York City, um, and of course, uh, so the humanistic model came out of this area of the country. Of course, I'm from Indiana. Well, you didn't know that. I'm from Indiana. <laughs> So, uh, coming from Indiana, it uh, uh, Carl Rogers makes a lot of sense to me, and all, and uh, Abraham Maslow makes sense as well. But being a city person, it doesn't make as much sense as Rogers. Humanistic psychologists rejected the research approach because it missed the whole human being. Beginning with Maslow and Rogers, there was an insistence on humanistic research program. Now, the interesting thing about both uh, Rogers and Maslow was that they were Freudians. They were trained as Freudians, and they both rejected the Freudian model because it, um, uh, it wasn't human enough. <clears throat> 
it saw humans as flawed and they saw humans as good. And if society would leave, leave them, it was society that was bad and it was society that was training people to be bad. That's that's how they felt anyway. This program was, has been largely qualitative, not measurement-based, but there, are, there exists a number of quantitative research strains within humanistic psychology, including research on happiness, self-concept, meditation, and uh, the outcomes of humanistic psychotherapy. Carl Rogers was also an American psychologist who emphasized the potential for good that exists within, within all people. Rogers used a, a, a therapeutic technique known as client-centered therapy. Uh, client-centered therapy involves the patient uh, taking a lead role in the therapy session. Rogers believed that a therapist needed to display three features to maximize the effectiveness of this particular approach, unconditional positive regard, genuineness and empathy and as you if you get into uh, counseling psychology of course uh, the in introduction to counseling uh, all three of these things will actually genuineness and empathy are huge and I think I have a video of Carl Rogers yeah, here we go I am very fortunate, and the client is very fortunate, if I can feel I really accept you fully just as you are. Uh, sometimes that's very difficult. I held an interview with a young man in South Africa. I didn't know anything about him. It turned out he was an officer uh, in the South African Army. Now, for me, that meant a real it meant that I stretched my empathic abilities to their very limit to try to be with him, to try to understand him, to try to be caring toward him. Uh, I didn't feel I did too well. And yet, uh, I've learned since that interview really changed the course of his life. Um, so, I feel that if I can be genuinely understanding, try to... Uh, Listen not only to the words, but to the meaning, trying to understand the person that's hidden within each one of us. Uh, that's helpful. If I really care about this person uh, in an unconditional way, that's helpful. If I can really be myself in a relationship, not, not a professional expert, not a quote, psychologist, not a psychotherapist, just me in that relationship, that's helpful. Um, all those things are possible, and when they come together, that creates a very powerful climate for change, for, for growth, um, for drawing out the potential of the, of the climate. There we go, Carl. Way to go, Carl. Uh, Carl's no longer with us. Oh, this is a BF Skinner. Oh, that's Heinz Kohler. Okay, I thought that was BF Skinner. It sure looks like BF Skinner. Anyway, there we go, Carl Rogers. That's what he looked like. He, he died. Uh, actually, um, I, I can remember uh, watching tapes of uh, Carl Rogers. <laughs> uh, he smoked a lot. <laughs> he smoked through the whole therapy. It was really kind of, kind of interesting. Anyway, well, we are not worry about Carl. <clears throat> Unconditional positive regard refers to the fact that the therapist accepts the client for who they are, no matter what he or she might say. Provided these factors, Rogers believed that people were more than capable of dealing with and working through their own issues. Rogers' client-centered therapy uh, approach to therapy is still commonly used in psychotherapeutic settings today. And of course, when, uh, when I first started, we didn't call it client-centered therapy, we called it patient-centered therapy. And then, of course, they, they changed it client-centered therapy. Now they, call, now they refer to it as person-centered therapy. Throughout the 40s and 50s, psychology was being pulled in two completely opposite directions. The strict empirical of objectivity and dehumanization of behaviorism and the humanistic focus on feeling and the individual. In the 1950s and 60s, a new melding of the two schools began with the cognitive revolution. 
The cognitive focus was to explain the individual mental process by use of the scientific, the science available, especially through the new field of computers. Now, this is weird because in the 60s, a computer was the size of a desk. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't on your, your watch. It wasn't on your phone. <laughs> it wasn't on your laptop. It uh, wasn't on your iPad. It was, it was the size of a desk, and you certainly couldn't carry one around. The new field not only compared the human brain to the organization necessary in computer science, but linguistics, anthropology, and neuroscience as well. The European psychology had never really been as influenced by behaviorism as had American psychology, and thus the cognitive revolution helped reestablish lines of communication between European psychologists and their American counterparts. I know this sounds kind of silly that that a Euro, that a Europeans and Americans weren't uh, weren't uh, uh, communicating with one another, but that's the way it was. Uh, one of the more famous uh, psychologists um, of the last 100 years was Jean Piaget, who was Swiss. He was, he was from Switzerland, and he spoke French. And he wrote in French, and we didn't read him. He, he started uh, his theories back in the 30s, but we didn't read him in the United States because he was European. And because the European psychology wasn't being studied in the United States. So we didn't really deal with Piaget and his ideas until the 1970s, until this cognitive uh, revolution took place. The influence and prominence of this particular perspective resonates in modern day society, uh, psychology. Sorry. Uh, culture is, uh, has important impacts on individuals and social psychology. Uh, yet the effects of culture and psychology are understudied. There is a risk that psychological theories and data derived from white American settings could be assumed to apply to individuals and social groups from other, from other cultures, and this is unlikely to be true. One weakness in cross-cultural psychology is that in looking for differences in psychological attributes across cultures, there remains a need to go beyond simple statistics. And of course, this uh, can be a problem, is the fact that we just assume uh, that, uh, that everybody is the same. This is, this is the, the, the concept of diversity, uh, so that uh, one culture uh, will have exactly the same problems as as the culture of Harvard or the culture of, of uh, Chicago or Stanford. Uh, but the reality is that different cultures have different problems. They also have different ways of looking at things. And of course, you, you guys are Navajo. Uh, you look at things totally differently than the dominant white culture uh, in the United States. You, will, you would have to say that the fifth floor uh, is telling you that on a, on a fairly regular basis. So looking at this picture, we have uh, East Asians. Whoops, I don't have a, let's see, I don't have an arrow. Looking at this picture, we have East Asians. Uh, we have an African American. Uh, he looks like uh, he's from the Middle East. Uh, she may be from the Middle East. Uh, he may be from the Middle East, and this is the only potential uh, uh, dominant white Caucasian in the group, potentially. But we, you never know. You never know. This guy may be as well. This is University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. And these are PhDs in psychology, I believe. I think that's, yeah, mine is blue. Okay. Anyway, not important. So the idea is that different cultures will have different ideas. In 1920, Francis Cecil Sumner uh, was the first African American to receive a PhD in psychology in the United States, and this is him in his PhD robes. Much of the work of early psychologists from diverse backgrounds was dedicated to challenging intelligence testing and promoting innovative educational methods for children. In 1894, Margaret Floyd Washburn was the first woman awarded the doctoral degree in psychology. Washburn uh, worked in comparative psychology. In the mid-1890s, Mary Whitten Culkins completed all requirements toward the PhD in psychology, but Harvard University, in their brilliance, refused to award her that degree because she was a woman, as stupid as that sounds. 
Calkins did uh, memory research, but she was still a psychologist. And so, despite Harvard being silly. Inez uh, Beverly Prozer was the first black woman to receive her PhD in psychology in 1933 from the University of Cincinnati. <clears throat> the research by Prozer, along with Frances Sumner, was instrumental in the court case of Brown versus the Board of Education in integrating American schools. Now, one of the things that was happening in the 1950s, uh, pre prior to the 1950s, the idea was that black people were not as, in, as intelligent as white people. That was the idea, and, and therefore uh, they, they wanted them schooled separately, especially in the South, where there is a, a larger percentage of African Americans in, in the South. Uh, so they, they were rationalizing their, uh, separation, uh, their uh, separation of education. <clears throat> and then of course the, uh, the research by, uh, by Prozer and Sumner uh, changed that idea because they proved uh, that this was a totally erroneous idea. There was no basis of fact. <clears throat> The study of brain and nervous system has enjoyed increased popularity over the past several decades through the development of various brain imaging machines. Initially, the only way of mapping the activity of the brain was through an EEG, or electroencephalogram, and this is what an electroencephalogram looks like. X-rays are not really sensitive enough to show a good picture of the inner workings of the brain. But with succeeding generations of brain imaging machines, a working view of the brain and its structures has become possible. Uh, autopsy was, was just not adequate to give you that information. And besides, the patient was dead, so it really didn't matter what you found. They were already gone. The next generation of brain imaging instruments was the, the CAT scan, the computerized axial tomography scan, uh, uh, CAT scan is an x-ray of a thin sliver of body tissue, and because it is a thin sliver, uh, you can read what is in that thin sliver. Uh, and here you have a, a tumor. Whoops, that's a tumor, and that's a tumor starting over on this side as well. And we've got another one right there. Uh, the next generation of brain imaging instruments was the MRI, the magnetic resonance imaging. Um, MRIs use a series of magnetic fields to detect the chemical uh, activity in the brain. And this is what an MRI looks like. The latest brain imaging instrument is the PET scan, or the positron emission tomography. Uh, this brain uh, imaging instrument detects radioactive glucose, that has previously been injected into the individual being used in the brain. And this is what a PET scan looks like. This is, uh, I'm not sure what that is. Okay, well anyway, these are PET scans. Evolutionary psychologists attempt to determine perpetual mental attributes that are true and will potentially continue to be true no matter which culture you were looking at over time. Such attributes as aggression and mating patterns may have perpetual patterns that are carried through succeeding generations and will continue into the future. And that's, of course, what psychology, psychology is looking for laws. We're looking for ideas that will always be there. Now, this is really hard because different cultures, of course, they uh, influence people to act in a certain way. And so the question is always, is it the culture or is it is, is this the way humans always will be? Evolutionary psychology follows the precepts of Charles Darwin that there is a basic structure to survival. It is that the most capable attributes of a species will assist the species in surviving and reproducing. Those aspects uh, that do not will not be repeated. And this is Charles Darwin, and that is a picture of a, <laughs> a marmot with... <laughs> <laughs> with the skull of a uh, mountain mountain goat. And, of course, there are some things that just don't make a whole lot of sense. This is what a peacock looks like. This is what a male peacock looks like. This is what a peahen looks like, and this is what her chicks look like. But this is fairly non-functional. Carrying around this long tail just makes absolutely no sense at all until you understand that the only way that... that uh, 
that he's going to be able to reproduce is by producing this huge tail, which attracts the female. And then, of course, he gets to be the, the, the breeder of the, uh, of the female. He gets to mate with her. Uh, cardinals, you can see them coming from miles away because they're red uh, against uh, green and against brown or whatever. Uh, so what sense does that make for the male to be red? Well, the redder the male is, uh, the more likely he gets to uh, be the, uh, the father of the offspring. And this is what the female looks like. She's fairly camouflaged, but uh, the, uh, there's no camouflage that works with red. <laughs> It just doesn't happen. Cognitive perspective of psychology is very popular in the United States. Cognitive psychology primarily looks at mental processes to understand uh, behavior, uh, thinking, memory, language, problem solving, and creativity. Cognitivists concentrate more on mental processes than on behavioral processes. Developmental psychology is the scientific study of development across a lifespan. Developmental psychologists are interested in processes related to physical maturation. They are focused on physical changes as well as changes in cognitive skills, moral reasoning, social behavior, and other psychological attributes. And of course, we've had a lot of shootings lately, uh, mass shootings, and we're trying to figure out why, what's going on, how can we, uh, how can we keep this from happening in the future? So all of, all of psychology is, is delving into these, uh, these mass shootings that are taking place. What is happening? Why, why is this person doing this? What can we do to change this? And psychology, uh, as well as, as criminal justice, is looking into these, uh, into these mass shootings. Early developmental psychologists focused primarily on changes that occurred through reaching adulthood providing enormous insight into the differences in physical, cognitive, and social capacities that exist between very young children and adults. Research by Jean Piaget. Here's the guy that uh, started uh, uh, theorizing back in the 30s, uh, but it wasn't read in the United States because he wrote in the wrong language. And, of course, we were mad at the French after World War II. Uh, especially after 1969, when they kicked it, when uh, they left NATO and kicked us out of France, actually. Uh, so, and of course, he wasn't French. He was he was uh, Swiss, but he wrote in French. Research by Jean Piaget uh, demonstrated that very young children do not demonstrate object permanence. Object permanence refers to the understanding that physical things continue to exist even if they are hidden from us. Uh, if you uh, were to show an adult a toy and then hide it behind a curtain, the adult knows that the toy still exists. The child doesn't until up to a certain point. And this is, what, uh, like uh, six, eight months they, they develop object permanence. Personality psychology focuses on patterns of thoughts and behaviors that make each individual unique. The American psychologist Gordon Allport uh, contributed to early theories of personality. Uh, these theory, or early theories attempted to explain how an individual's personality develops from his or her given perspective. Freud proposed that personality arose as conflicts between conscious and unconscious parts of the mind, where, and these were carried out over the lifespan. Specifically, Freud theorized that an individual went through various psychosexual stages of development. Adult personality would result from the resolution of various conflicts that centered on the migration of, of erogenous or sexual pleasure-producing zones from the uh, mouth, the, the oral, to the anus, to the phallus, to the genitals. And it starts out with the mouth, that's how they eat, then uh, potty training, that's the anus, uh, then it goes to, uh, they discover uh, their penis or their, their uh, reproductive area, and then, of course, they resolve all of this and become uh, active sexual adults. Like many of Freud's theories, this particular idea was controversial and did not lend itself to experimental tests. Really hard to, to do a, an experiment that deals with this. Rather than explaining how personality arises, current research is focused on identifying personality traits measuring them, and determining how they interact in a particular context. 
Personality traits are relatively consistent patterns of thought and behavior, and many have proposed that five trait dimensions are sufficient to capture the variations in personality seen across individuals. These five dimensions are known as the Big Five, or the five-factor model, and include dimensions of conscientiousness, agreeableness, neuroticism, openness, and extroversion. Each of these traits have been demonstrated to be relatively stable over the lifespan as, and is influenced by our genetics. Social psychology promotes study population, uh, studying populations by their cultural beliefs, attitudes, and values rather than trying to establish similarities between groups. These scientists seek to discover how different cultural norms affect behavior and mental processes. While most psychological perspectives try to amalgamate people throwing them in, into general categories, social psychologists articulate the differences. Social psychology allows scientists to demonstrate how select cultural proclivities influence social, political, or economic factors on behavior and development. Only by recognizing regional and ethnic differences can demographers target specific areas to, to identify specific social problems in the area such as low test scores, high drug usage, or frequent suicide. In the 1960s, Nazi war criminals were still being caught and executed. They all used the defense that they were only following orders when they executed approximately 6 million Jews and millions of others. Stanley Milgram wanted to know if this was true. Do people really follow such stupid orders? Milgram brought uh, in two subjects. One was to induce uh, better memory in, the, or in uh, the other by shocking the other individual if they answered a question incorrectly. Every time one subject was wrong, the other subject would increase the voltage and shock him. This was the idea. The voltage went from a tingly 45 volts to a near deadly 450 volts. Unfortunately, electricity reduces memory instead of improves it, and all subjects had to be taken up to the 450 volt mark. No matter how much the subject screamed, cried, and pleaded, the doctor researcher instructed the subject to shock them. While the subject being shocked was an actor who wasn't really being shocked, the subjects didn't know that. Of the 40 men in Milgram's initial experiment, 93% agreed to the experiment and 65% shocked the victim up to 450 volts, despite the screams. P.S. I was only kidding. Ah, clowns. The Milgram experiment was really an experiment about obedience, and when it was repeated with other subject configurations and around the world, the percentage of people willing to shock the victim of, uh, to the max was between 61 and 67% like two-thirds, two-thirds of all the people were willing, were willing to be obedient. Two out of every three. Sugar and spice and everything mean. <clears throat> Variations, adult women uh, got the same result, 65%. Uh, so it wasn't just the men that were, were mean. Uh, the women were obedient as well. In 1966, Hofling and uh, his colleagues uh, nurses were telephoned uh, by a doctor they didn't know. They were ordered to administer non-prescribed uh, drugs in, uh, in double the maximum dosage to a patient. Uh, 22 nurses were called. 21 out of 22 uh, nurses, 95.5%, followed the doctor's orders to administer a lethal dosage of drugs. Of course, nobody died in the process. Uh, they rescinded the, the, uh, the order before they killed anybody. But 95% of the, the nurses were going to administer the lethal dosage. Industrial organizational psychology conducts research to improve the workplace environment for both employees and managers. They work as consultants to design programs to improve morale, to increase job satisfaction, to foster better communication, to enhance productivity, to increase worker involvement and decision making. With the advance of medicine, psychologists began to realize that human emotions, such as stress and depression, could alter the physical health of the individual. 
and cause things like ulcers, skin diseases, stomach disorders, infectious diseases, and cancers. Now, this is especially true in the United States. Why? Because the United States is an individualistic country, uh, country and each individual feels like they are there by themselves. Now, in collectivist countries, they don't have the same problems that we have in the United States because people are being supported by their relatives, by their clans, by their group, by whoever, uh, because they're, they are, they're in it together. Uh, but in the United States, um, because of our individualism, individualism, uh, health psychology is very important. Health psychology teaches techniques to control these emotions in order to pr promote good health. Researchers in sport and exercise psychology study the psychological aspects of sports performance, including motivation and performance anxiety and the effects of sports on mental and emotional well-being. Research is also conducted on similar topics as they relate to physical exercise in general, such as mental and physical performance under demanding conditions like firefighting, military operations, artistic performance, and surgery. Clinical psychology is the area of psychology that focuses on the diagnosis and treatment of psychological disorders and other problematic patterns of behavior. As such, it is generally considered to be a more applied area within psychology. Counseling psychology is a similar discipline that focuses on emotional, social, vocational, and health-related outcomes in individuals who are considered psychologically healthy. While aspects of Freud's psychoanalytic theory are still found among some of today's therapists, Roger's ideas about client-centered therapy have been especially influential in shaping how many clinicians operate. Both behaviorism and the cognitive revolution have shaped clinical practice in the forms of behavioral therapy, cognitive therapy, and cognitive behavioral therapy. This is the area of psychology, er, psychology that receives the most attention in popular media, and many people mistakenly assume that all psychology is clinical psychology. Forensic psychology is a branch of psychology that deals, uh, deals questions of psychology as they arise in the context of the justice system. Uh, you have a, uh, one of your instructors is a forensic psychologist. Uh, Professor Barber is a forensic psychologist. Forensic psychologists will assess a person's whoops <laughs> will assess a person's competency to stand trial, assess the state of mind of a defendant, act as consultants on child custody cases, consult on sentencing and treatment recommendations, and advise on issues such as eyewitness testimony and children's testimony. Places you'll find psychologists, uh, universities, colleges, and other post-secondary schools, 37%. Hospitals and clinics, 28%. Business and consulting, 6%. Government, military, and criminal justice system, 8%. Primary and secondary schools and school districts, 6%. And other, 15%. Careers in psychology, clinical psychology takes up the uh, lion's share at 37%. Uh, counseling is only 13%. Um, uh, general psychology, that's what I am. I'm a general psychologist, is 7%. Uh, psychologists can work in many different places, uh, doing many different things. In general, anyone wishing to continue a career in psychology at a four-year institution of higher education will have to earn a doctoral degree in psychology for some specialties and at least a master's degree for others. In most areas of psychology, this means earning a PhD in a relevant area of psychology. Literally, PhD refers to a doctor of philosophy degree. But philosophy in this context refers to the ability to philosophize in the di discipline of psychology. So Dr. Uh, Dr. Russ is, has a PhD in psychology, uh, as do I. I have a, a PhD in psychology as well. And uh, Professor Barber will finish his uh, Psych D, his doctorate in psychology, uh, probably in uh, this summer, potentially this summer. 
Since the 1970s, individuals who wish to become practicing clinical psychologists have had another option for earning a doctoral degree, a Psych D. And this is what uh, uh, Professor Barber is getting. Oh, I forgot uh, 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 Dr. Begay. Dr. Begay has a uh, PhD in uh, clinical psychology. She is a clinical psychologist. Uh, Psych D is a uh, doctor of psychology degree that is increasing pop increasingly popular. Psych D degree uh, programs generally place less emphasis on research-oriented skills and focus more on the application of psychological principles in the clinical context. And that is the end of Chapter 1, but we have to tackle Chapter 2 as well. So let's go ahead and get started. We have 67 slides. So let's go ahead and get started. Chapter 2, Psychological Research. Uh, psychology is a science, and because it's a science, research is very important as far as psychology is concerned. That's the only way we can prove things. Um, it's it's a, what is considered a soft science. Uh, the reason it's referred to as a soft science is because it changes, uh, whereas other sciences, such as chemistry, uh, Chemistry doesn't change, physics doesn't change, biology doesn't change. All of these things are the hard sciences. But psychology is a soft science. And the reason it's a soft science is because people are constantly evolving and changing. Scientific research is a cr uh, critical tool for successfully navigating our complex world. Sorry, I needed a drink. <clears throat> Without it, we would be forced to rely solely on intuition and other people's authority and blind luck. While many of us feel confident in, in our abilities to decipher and interact with the world around us, history is filled with examples of how very wrong we can be when we fail to recognize the need for evidence in supporting claims. At various times in history, we would have been certain that the sun revolved around a flat earth, that the earth's con continents did not move, and that mental illness was caused by possession. It is through systematic scientific research that we divest ourselves of our preconceived notions and superstitions and gain an objective understanding of ourselves and our, our world. Scientific knowledge is advanced through a process known as the scientific method. Basically, ideas in the form of theories and hypotheses are tested against the real world in the form of empirical observations. And those empirical observations lead to more ideas that are tested against the real world, and so on. In this sense, the scientific process is circular. The types of reasoning within the circle are called deductive and inductive. In deductive reasoning, ideas are tested in the real world. In inductive reasoning, real-world observations lead to new ideas. In the scientific context, deductive reasoning begins with a generalization, one hypothesis, that is then used to reach logical conclusions about the real world. If the hypothesis is correct, then the logical conclusions reached through deductive reasoning should also be correct. Inductive reasoning uses empirical observations to construct broad generalizations. Conclusions drawn from inductive reasoning may or may not be correct, regardless of the observations on which they are based. Scientists use inductive reasoning to formulate theories, which in turn generate hypotheses that are tested with deductive reasoning. A theory is a well-developed set of ideas that proposes an explanation for observed phenomenon. Theories are repeatedly checked against the world, but they tend to be too complex to be tested all at once. Instead, researchers create hypotheses to test uh, specific aspects of a theory. A hypothesis is a testable prediction about how the world will behave if our idea is correct. And it is often worded as an if-then statement. For example, if I study all night, I will get a passing grade on the test. The hypothesis is extremely important because it bridges the gap between the realm of ideas and the real world. As specific hypotheses are tested, the theories are modified and refined to reflect and incorporate the result of these tests. 
You've heard the old wives' tale, are women really attracted to men who have an edge and reject nice guys? A study by a group from Texas A&M University used three interlocking studies to discover whether women found male dominance attractive. The theory was women are attracted to dominant men. Are you excited? <laughs> What's going to happen next? Results from the three studies showed that women were more attracted to men who were altruistic than ones who were dominant. However, women found men who were more dominant as more sexual and more physically attractive than men who were not dominant. Do nice guys finish last? Evidently, while women find dominant men more attractive, it is nice guys they would rather be around. Research from 1988 by David Buss indicates that women respond more readily to men who are more dominant and display their attributes more readily. So which is more accurate, the research from 1988 in Michigan or the research from 1995 in Texas? And this is a question that you have to answer for yourself. A scientific hypothesis is also uh, falsifiable or capable of being shown to be incorrect. Sigmund Freud had lots of interesting ideas to explain various human behaviors. However, a major criticism of Freud's theories is that many of his ideas are not falsifiable. Despite this, Freud's theories are widely taught in introductory psychology texts because of their historical significance for personality psychology and psychotherapy, and these remain the root of all modern forms of therapy. There are many research methods available to psychologists in their efforts to understand, describe, and explain behavior and the cognitive and biological processes that underlie it. Some methods rely on observational techniques. Other approaches involve interactions between the researcher and the individuals who are being studied, ranging from a series of simple questions to extensive, in-depth interviews to well-controlled experiments. Each of these research methods has unique strengths and weaknesses that each method may only be appropriate for certain types of research questions. Correlational research can find a relationship between two variables, but the only way to re the, a researcher can claim that the relationship between the variables is cause and effect is to perform an experiment. In experimental research, there is a tremendous amount of control over variables of interest. While this is a powerful approach, Experiments are often conducted in very artificial settings. This calls into question the validity of experimental findings and how they would apply in real-world settings. In observational research, scientists are conducting a clinical or case study when they focus on one person or just a few individuals. When they focus their attention on a very small number of people, they can gain a tremendous amount of insight into those cases. In scientists, if scientists ultimately want to explain all behavior, focusing attention on such a special group of people can make it difficult to generalize any observations to the larger population as a whole. Generalizing refers to the, the ability to apply the findings of a particular research project to larger segments of society. Case studies provide enormous amounts of information, but since the, the cases are, no are so specific, the potential to apply what's learned to the average person may be very limited. And this, this comic is very important, and this explains what I'm talking about. Yes, I got it to work. I have a positive result. Sample size number one. Uh, grad school uh, getting excited about insignificant in uh, significance. A few hundred more to go. And In other words, uh, this is what she was trying to prove. One person actually uh, did exactly what she thought they were going to do. Now she has to add a hundred more in order to prove that uh, her ideas are, are vi uh, viable. One of the best ways to gain information is to simply observe the behavior in its natural context. However, people might change their behavior in unexpected ways if they know that they are being observed. It is critical that the observer be an unobtrusive and as inconspicuous as possible. When people know that they're being watched, they are less likely to behave naturally. 
The greatest benefit of naturalistic observation is the validity or accuracy of information collected unobtrusively in a natural setting. Having individuals behave as they normally would in a given situation means that we have a higher degree of ecological validity or realism than we might achieve with other research approaches. Therefore, our ability to generalize the findings of research to a real-world situation is enhanced. A potential problem in observational research is observer bias. Generally, people who act as observers are closely involved in, research pro in the research project and may unconsciously skew their observations to fit their research goals or expectations. To combat this, researchers often compare observations of the same event by multiple observers in order to test inter-rater reliability, a measure of reliability that assesses the consistency of observations by different observers. Often psychologists develop surveys as a means of gathering data. Surveys are lists of questions to be answered by research participants and can be delivered as paper and pencil questionnaires, administered electronically, or conducted verbally. Generally, the survey itself can be completed in short time, and the case of administering a survey makes it easy to collect data from a large number of people. Surveys allow researchers to gather data from larger samples than may be afforded by other research methods. A sample is a subset of individuals selected from a population, which is the overall group of individuals that researchers are interested in. Researchers study the sample and seek to generalize their findings to the population. See, there's the sample. The population is this whole mass here. And the sample uh, is a sampling of that mass. Researchers will begin this process by calculating various measures of central tendency from the data that they have collected. These measures provide an overall summary of what a typical response looks like. There are three measures of central tendency, the mode, the median, and the mean. The mode is the most frequently occur, occurring response. That means that we look at all these numbers and we see which one happens the most. And in this case, it's five. We have four fours and we have six fives. So the mode is five. We only have two twos. Okay, so the mode is the most frequent number. The median lies at the middle of the given data. And this is our data. And if we put it in order, then the one in the middle is a nine. So the median value is nine. The mean is the arithmetic average of all the data points. Uh, so what you do is you add up all the numbers and divide by the sum of the number of values. In this case, we have four numbers, seven, nine, five, and three. We divide, uh, its totals uh, 24. Uh, we divide it by four because there are four numbers and we get six. That is the mean is six. The median in this case would be five and seven. And the mode, there is no mode because all, there's uh, four different numbers. There is both strength and weakness of survey in comparison to case studies. By using surveys, we can collect information from a larger sample of people. A larger sample is better able to reflect the actual diversity of the population, thus allowing better generalizability. Therefore, if our sample is sufficiently large and diverse, we can assume that the data we collect from the survey can be generalized to the larger population with more certain certainty than the information collected through a case study. However, given the greater number of people involved, we are not able to collect the same depth of information on each person that would be collected in a case study. <clears throat> Another potential weakness of surveys is that people don't always give accurate responses. Uh, they may lie, misremember or answer questions in a way that they think makes them look good. For example, people may report drinking less alcohol than is actually the case. And the reality is, I used to work in an emergency room, and I can tell you that uh, that's exactly what they say. I only had a couple. 
a person's <laughs> drunk as a skunk. They're inebriated out of their off out of their skulls, but they only had a couple beers. They always only had a couple beers. Well, you can you can smell it on their breath. You can even smell it in their sweat. But they only had a couple beers. Some researchers gain access to large amounts of data without interacting with a single research participant. Uh, now the reality is that the reason they came into the emer they came into the emergency room for a reason. They got hurt, they fell down, they had an automobile accident. But no matter what the problem was, they and I'm laughing about it. But the reality is, it was always serious, and we needed to take care of it. It was just kind of funny that they all always said the same thing. I only had a couple beers. Some researchers gain access to large amounts of data without interacting with a single research participant. Instead, they use existing records to answer various research questions. This type of research approach is known as archival research. Archival research relies on looking at past records or data sets to look for interesting patterns or relationships. Now, the problem with uh, archival research today is that a lot of this is uh, private and you can't really get into the, uh, into the archives. The researcher employing archival research never directly interacts with research participants. Therefore, the investment of time and money to collect data is considerably less with archival research. Additionally, researchers have no control over what information was originally collected. Therefore, research questions have to be tailored so they can be answered within the structure of the existing data sets. There is also no, no guarantee of consistency between the records from one source to another, which might make comparing and contrasting different data sets problematic. This is a problem that we're having with uh, with guns in the United States. Each state collects data in their own way. And because of that, when the FBI tries to collect the data, they're not getting the same answers from each state. They're not getting the same data from each state. So they, uh, so some of the data is skewed. When we test the same group of individuals repeatedly over an extended period of time, we are conducting longitudinal research. Longitudinal research is a research design in which data gathering is administered repeatedly over an extended period of time. And I was just reading a, a research. Uh, they've been doing longitudinal research on a group of individuals for 67 years, and they're getting some really good data. Uh, look what has happened in the last 67 years. I'm 73. I was born in 49. So that uh, the data started in 1955. This is data coming out of, uh, of Hawaii, uh, one of the islands of Hawaii. I'm trying to think which one it is. Kauai, I think. In cross-sectional research, a researcher compares multiple segments of the population at the same time. The researcher directly compares different groups of people by age instead of studying a group of people for 20 years. The researcher would compare 20-year-old individuals with a group of 30-year-old individuals and a group of 40-year-old individuals. Statistics show that when people buy ice cream, more crimes are likely to occur. When ice cream sales rise, crime rates rise. Does buying ice cream cause crime? There is little correlation between the two. Crime increases when it is hot, as does ice cream sales. Correlation means that there is a relationship between two or more variables, but this relationship does not necessarily imply cause and effect. When two variables are correlated, it simply means that as one variable changes, so does the other. We can measure correlation by calculating a statistic known as a correlational coefficient. A correlation uh, co coefficient is a number from minus 1 to plus 1 that indicates the strength and direction of the relationship between variables. The correlation coefficient is usually represented by the letter R. The number of uh, proportion of the correlation coefficient indicates the strength of the relationship. The closer to the number, the number is to positive 1, negative or, or positive, the more strongly related the variables are, and the more predictable changes in one variable will be as the other variable changes. So we're, we're looking at, at uh, a point between minus 1 and plus 1. So the closest to minus 1 it is, 
the stronger the correlation between the negative correlation, the, the closer it is to a positive one, the closer it is to a positive correlation. If it's closer to zero, the weaker the relationship and the less predictable the relationship between the variables becomes. For instance, a correlation coefficient of 0 0.9 indicates a far stronger relationship than the correlation coefficient of 0 0.3. If the variables are not related to one another at all, the correlation uh, coefficient will be 0. The sign, positive or negative, of the correlation coefficient indicates the direction of the relationship. A positive correlation means that the variable uh, moves in the same direction. Put, uh, put another way, it means that as one variable increases, so does the other. And conversely, when one variable decreases, so does the other, like in ice cream and crime. Ice cream and crime, uh, ice cream sales go up when, uh, when crime goes up. Well, actually, when it gets hotter, uh, and that's a positive correlation. So if we studied ice cream sales, we could tell when crime was going up because that would mean that it was getting hotter. A negative correlation means that the variables move in opposite directions. If one variable, uh, if two variables are negatively correlated, a decrease in one variable is associated with an increase in the other and vice versa. So if we were looking at chili sales and crime, what we would discover was that they have a negative correlation because chili is something you eat when it's, it's cold and crime goes up when it's hot. Therefore, chili sales would go uh, d uh, down when it was hot because people didn't want to put that hot stuff in their stomachs. Uh, and, uh, well, as you, you know, you understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> Correlations can have predictive value. There is a positive correlation between an individual's height and their weight. A negative correlation exists between someone's tiredness during the day and the number of hours they slept the previous night. The amount of sleep decreases as the feelings of tiredness increase. We find no correlation between hours of sleep and shoe size. <clears throat> Correlation is limited because establishing the existence of a relationship tells us little about cause and effect. While variables are sometimes correlated because one does cause the other, it could also be that some other factor or con confounding variable, variable is actually causing the systematic movement in our variables of interest. In the ice cream crime rate example mentioned earlier, temperature is a confounding variable that could account for the relationship between the two variables. The temptation to make erroneous cause and effect statements based on correlational research is not the only way we tend to misinterpret data. We also tend to make the mistake of illusory correlations, especially with unsystematic observations. Illusory correlations or false correlations occur when people believe that relationships exist between two things when no such relationship exists, like the ice cream and the crime. Why are, why are we so apt uh, to believe illusory correlations like this? Often we read or hear about them and simply accept the information as valid. Or we have a hunch about how something works and then look for evidence to support that hunch, ignoring evidence that would tell us our hunch is false. This is known as confirmation bias. Other times we find illusory correlations based on the information that comes most easily to mind, even if the information is severely limited. In scientific context, an experiment has precise requirements for design and implementation. In order to conduct an experiment, a researcher must have a specific hypothesis to be tested. And, and hypotheses can be formulated either through direct uh, observation of the real world or after careful review of previous research. Personal observations are what often lead us to formulate a specific hypothesis, but we cannot use limited personal observations and anecdotal evidence to rigorously test our hypothesis. Instead, we find out if real-world data supports our hypothesis. We have to conduct an experiment. The most basic experimental design involves two groups, the experimental group and the control group. 
The two groups are designed to be the same except for one difference, experimental manipulation. The experimental group gets the experimental manipulation, that is, the treatment or variable being tested, and the control group does not. Since experimental manipulation is the only difference between the experimental and control groups, we can be sure that any differences between the two are due to experimental manipulation rather than chance. We also need to precisely define or operationalize how we measure our variable. An operational definition is a precise description of our variables, and it is important in allowing others to understand exactly how and what a researcher measures in a particular experiment. This aids people's ability to interpret our data as well as their capacity to repeat our experiment should they choose to do so. Ideally, the people who score the tests are unaware of who was assigned to the experimental or control group in order to control for experimental bias. Experimenter bias refers to the possibility that, as a, that a researcher's expectations might skew the results of the study. And uh, actually, I did uh, scientific research when I was uh, working in a children's uh, clinic in uh, uh, Vienna, Virginia. I was a laboratory technician. We were trying to determine if uh, flu tests, uh, these tests that, uh, that uh, take about 15 minutes, you, you get some snot on a swab and you stick it in, the, in this solution, and it tells you whether you have the flu or not. Well, that, those haven't been around forever. So in uh, 1999, 2000, and 2001, I was working in a, uh, a clinical laboratory or in a laboratory at a, uh, a pediatric clinic in uh, Vienna, Virginia, and we were trying to determine if, we, if any of these um, uh, tests were any good, any of these uh, flu tests. So we had several flu tests, and we tried them, and... and uh, uh, we, um, when we got a positive, we would take the specimen and we would send it to the state lab to find out what kind of flu it had or whether it had any flu at all. And we found out that, that some of the tests were, were fairly accurate. Uh, and that's how the flu test came to be. Somebody, not we weren't the only ones. There were other people that were doing the research at the same time. But we were doing the research with, uh, with uh, adolescents and with children, and of course they were testing with adults. So it was very important to see if, if this worked with the adults, does it also work with the children? And that's what we were doing. So we were, and we didn't know, of course, whether the specimens would, would come back positive or not. But uh, when we got a, a positive, we would send it out. And we sent some negative tests out as well to see if it missed some. And what we found was about 90, between 90 uh, and 95 percent were accurate. If the observers know who is in which group, it might influence how they interpret ambiguous res responses. And this was a problem because the doctor uh, owned stock in one of the, in one of the companies, and he wanted that one to do really well. Well, we couldn't do that. You know, I wouldn't let him do that. I wouldn't let him know which was which, um, and. Uh, so we were able to, to do a good uh, scientific experiment. By being blind uh, uh, to who is in which group, the researcher is protected against those biases. This situation is a single blind study, meaning that one of the group's participants are unaware as to which group they are in, experiment or control group, while the researcher who developed the experiment knows which participants are in each group. We also did uh, uh, experiments with uh, otitis media. Otitis media is inner ear, ear infection, not inner ear infection, it's middle ear infection. Anyway, so we were doing uh, uh, experiments with uh, antibiotics, and uh, he was giving out antibiotics for, since we were a, a, a pediatrics uh, clinic, uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, ear infections. And because of that, he was handing out these antibiotics, and some of them worked and some of them didn't. And uh, that's, that, was a, that was actually a blind study. The other one was we were just testing the uh, uh, flu tests. A double blind study with uh, both the researchers and the participants are blind to group assignments. And this is what we had. We had a double blind. By doing so, we can control for both experimenter and participant ex expectations. 
The placebo effect occurs when people's expectations or beliefs influence or determine their experience in a given situation. In other words, simply expecting something to happen can actually make it happen. In a research experiment, we strive to study whether changes in one thing cause changes in another. To achieve this, we must pay attention to two important variables or things that can be changed in any experimental study. The independent variable and the dependent variable. An independent variable is manipulated or controlled by the experimenter. In a well-designed experimental study, the independent variable is the only important difference between the experimental and the control groups. A dependent variable is what the researcher measures to see how much effect the independent variable had. Now that our study is designed, we need to obtain a, simple, a sample of individuals to include the experiment. In the experiment, I'm sorry. We need to determine who to include. Participants are the subjects of psychological research. Individuals who are involved in psychological research actively participate in the process. Often psychological research projects rely on college students to serve as participants. The vast majority of research in psychology subfields has historically involved students as research uh, participants. And if you take my social psychology class, and I don't I only teach it in the summertime, but if you take my social psychology class, I have my students participate in ongoing research in social psychology. It's really kind of fascinating. I find it fascinating. Of course, the students find it uh, obnoxious, but hey, well, we do it anyway. Uh, these are experiments not being conducted by me. They're being conducted by uh, psychologists all, all around the world uh, who have surveys uh, that I have my students take. And, and by doing this, they understand how psychological research actually works, especially social psychological research. And I think that's important. But are college students truly representative of, of the general population? College students tend to be younger, more educated, more liberal, and less diverse than the general population. Although using students as test subjects is an accepted practice, relying on such a limited pool of research participants can be problematic because it is difficult to generalize findings to the larger population. For one thing, you're healthier. Uh, you tend to be younger, especially traditional students. Now, at uh, Diné College, of course, traditional means one thing, uh, but in the general population of uh, the United States, a traditional student is somebody who graduates from high school and then goes directly into college. So they're 18 years old when they graduate from high school. At 19, they, go, they become a freshman in college, and at 22, they graduate from, from uh, college. That's a traditional student. A non-traditional student is somebody who waits to go to college until they're older. They're in their, in their 20s or 30s or 40s. That's a non-traditional student. If possible, a random sample should be used. A random sample is a subset of a larger population in which every member of the population has an equal chance of being selected. Random samples are preferred because if the sample is large enough, we can be reasonably sure that the participating individuals are representative of the larger population. This means that the percentages of characteristics in the sample, their sex, ethnicity, socioeconomic level, and any other characteristics that might affect the results are close to those percentages in the larger population. The next step of, ex of the experimental process is to split the participants into experimental and control groups through random assignment. With random assignment, all the participants have an equal chance of being assigned to either group. Random assignment is critical for sound experimental design. With sufficiently large samples, random assignment makes it unlikely that there are differences between the groups. We would be very unlikely, it would be very unlikely that we would get one group composed entirely of males or a given religious ideology. This is important because if the groups were systematically different before the experiment began, we would not know the origin of any differences we find between the groups. 
Were the differences pre-existing, or were they caused by manipulation of the independent variable? And of course, this is a problem with politics. In politics, the Republicans want to show that, that everybody loves uh, Republican ideas, and Democrats want to show that everybody loves Democratic ideas. So when they do a survey, they usually do a survey of their own people. Uh, Democrats uh, only survey Democrats, and Republicans only survey Republicans. And because of that, you can't really believe what the GOP says about a, a, a topic or the even the Democrat or the Democrats you can't believe what they say because usually they have skewed results from their surveys. Random assignment allows us to assume that any differences observed between experimental and control groups result from the mani manipulation of the independent variable. True experiments require the experimenter to manipulate an independent variable, and that can, uh, can complicate many questions that psychologists might want to address. We categorize this type of research approach as quasi-experimental and recognize that we cannot make cause and effect claims in these circumstances. Experimenters are also limited by ethical constraints. Now, so the reality is that most psychological research is is a quasi-research, it's a quasi-experiment, because we cannot manipulate the variables. Now, in chemistry, you can. You can control what chemicals go together. In biology, uh, you're looking at specific animals. So that's a, that's a solid uh, idea. In physics, it's the same idea. But in psychology, where you're dealing with ideas, different minds, different uh, different ways of looking at things, there's no way that you can completely control a variable. Therefore, most psycho psychological research is quasi-research. Once data is collected from both the experimental and the control groups, a, st a statistical analysis is conducted to find out if there are meaningful differences between the two groups. A statistical analysis determines how likely any difference found is due to chance, and thus not meaningful. Generally, psychologists consider differences to be statistically significant if, if, there, if there is less than a 5% chance of observing them if the groups did not actually differ from one another. Stated another way, psychologists want to limit the chances of making false positive claims uh, to 5% or less. Let's look at this joke. Do you have significant results on your project yet? Uh, not yet, sir, still working on it. Hmm. How about now? Still nothing. <laughs> oh, funny. The greatest strength of experiments is the ability to assert that any significant differences in the findings are caused by the independent variable. This occurs because random selection, random assignment, and a design that limits the effects of both experimenter bias and participant expectancy should create groups that are similar in composition and treatment. Therefore, any difference between the groups is attributable to the independent variable, and now we can finally make a, a causal statement. When psychologists complete a research project, they generally want to share their findings with other scientists. The American Psychological Association, the APA, publishes a manual detailing how to write a paper for submission to scientific journals. And right now, we are in... Uh, the APA manual 7th uh, edition, and it's uh, orange and blue and green and uh, rust and red and blue. Well, anyway, it's, uh, it's multicolored. It's kind of interesting because uh, I've been doing this for uh, since the 1970s, and I have uh, five different colors, four different colors of uh, uh, publication manuals because they change it from time to time. Uh, and the reason they change it is because uh, databases change uh, and websites change. So that's why, that's why they have to change it from time to time. Scientific journals uh, generally publish peer-reviewed journals, uh, articles, aimed at an audience of professionals and scholars who are actively involved in research themselves. Peer review provides some degree of, of quality control for psychological research. 
Poorly conceived or executed studies can be weeded out, and even well-designed research can be improved by the revisions suggested. Peer review also ensures that the research is described clearly enough to allow other scientists to replicate it, meaning they can repeat the experiment using different samples to determine reliability. Reliability and validity are two important considerations that must be made with any type of data collection. Reliability refers to the ability to consistently produce a given result. In the context of psychological research, this would mean that any instruments or, or tools used to collect data do so in consistent, reproducible ways. There are a number of different types of reliability. Inter-rater reliability, the degree to which two or more different observers agree on what has been observed. Internal consistency, the degree to which different items on a survey that measure the same thing correlate with one another. And test-retest reliability, the degree to which the outcomes of a particular measure remain consistent over multiple administrations. Unfortunately, being consistent in measurement does not necessarily mean that you have measured something correctly. This is where validity comes into play. Validity refers to the extent to which a given instrument or tool accurately measures what it's supposed to measure, and there are a number of ways in which validity can be expressed. Ecological validity, the degree to which research results generalize to real-world applications, Construct validity, the degree to which a given variable actually captures or measures what it is intended to measure. And face validity, the, deg the degree to which a given variable seems valid on the surface. While any valid measure is reliable, the reverse is not necessarily true. Today, scientists agree that good research is ethical in nature and is guided by a basic respect for human dignity and safety. Modern researchers must demonstrate that the research that they perform is ethically sound. Any experiment involving the participation of human subjects is governed by extensive, strict guidelines designed to ensure that the experiment does not result in harm to the participants. Any research institution that uh, receives, uh, and, and one of the things we could talk about is Milgram's experiment. If you remember, Milgram was, was uh, taking one individual, and they were testing to see if they would be obedient, despite the fact that the individual on the other side of the wall was screaming and saying, he's hurting me, he's hurting me. Uh, now, he was, of course, a Confederate. He, he wasn't being hurt. Uh, but it, it caused the individual who was doing the experiment to worry about, uh, about hurting him. And potentially he could have caused uh, harm to that individual by, by uh, uh, increasing his, stre his stress. Now the reality is that if uh, Milgram were doing the experiment today, it would probably not be approved because it is unethical to lie to a participant like that. Uh, he was he was measuring obedience, and he wasn't telling them that they were measuring obedience. He told them that they were measuring uh, education and shock, um, so knowledge and shock. Any research institution that receives uh, federal support for research involving human participants must have access to an Institutional Review Board, or, or IRB. The IRB is a committee of individuals often made up of members of the institution's administration, scientists, and community members. The purpose of the IRB is to review proposals for research that involves human participants. The IRB reviews these proposals with the principles mentioned uh, above in mind, and generally approval from the IRB is required in order for the experiment to proceed. In other words, you can't do it unless the IRB tells you it's okay. Now, uh, Diné College does have an IRB, uh, Internal Review Board, and it's headed by uh, Dr. Uh, Suzanne Russ. An institutional's IRB requires several components in any experiment it approves. Each participant must sign an informed consent form before they can participate in the experiment. An informed consent form provides a written description of what participants can expect during the experiment, including potential risks and implications of the research. 
It also lets participants know that their involvement is completely voluntary and can be discontinued without penalty at any time. The informed consent guarantees that any data collected in the experiment will remain completely confidential. In cases where research participants are under the age of 18, the parents or legal guardians are required to sign the informed consent. While the informed consent form should be as honest as possible in describing exactly what participants will be doing, sometimes deception is necessary to prevent participants' knowledge of the exact research question from affecting the results of the study. Deception involves purposely misleading experiment participants in order to maintain the integrity of the experiment, but not to the point where the deception could be considered harmful. And this is the question that came up about Milgram. Was his deception harmful to his the participants? Many psychologists conduct research involving animal subjects. Often these researchers are rodents or birds as the subjects of their experiments. The APA estimates that 90% of all animal research in psychology uses either birds or rodents. The humane and ethical treatment of animal research subjects is a critical aspect of this type of research. Researchers must design their experiments to minimize any pain or distress experienced by animals serving as research subjects. Whereas IRBs review research proposals that involve human participants, animal experimental proposals are reviewed by an Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, an IACUC. And that is the end of Chapter 2. Uh, okay, so you, you, uh, I expect you to take uh, the two quizzes uh, for Chapter 1 and Chapter 2. Uh, I do not use my quizzes as to, qu to quiz you. I use my quizzes as reviews. So the reason I want you to take the quizzes is to review the information that I've given you. And what you will discover is that, and I don't care whether you use your book, you can use the PowerPoint, it doesn't really matter to me. I just want you to review the information. So there are 15 questions dealing with this chapter, okay? Those 15 questions are 15 pieces of information that I want you to have, <clears throat> that I want you to remember. Now the reality is, the more times you read the same, you get the same information. The more times you get that piece of information, the more likely you are to remember it. The, num the magic number seems to be three, but uh, every once in a while, uh, if it's exciting enough, uh, then uh, you will remember something after only, uh, only seeing it or hearing it one time. So while you are taking a quiz, and I will score the quiz, that's not, that will be uh, part of, uh, of your final grade, uh, the reality is it's not a quiz as to test you to find out if you have this knowledge. It is a piece of information that I want you to have, and that's why I give you the quizzes. I give it to you so that you can remember that information, and I am showing you what I think is important in this chapter. That's why I give you quizzes, not to test you. It's to review for you to review the information okay so you will take two quizzes one for chapter one and one for chapter two and probably you'll have to go back and you'll have to look it up i don't consider that this isn't cheating because i'm not really testing you <laughs> what i'm trying to get you to do is to remember these pieces of information i think these this information is important and that's why i give you the quizzes um okay so there you go. That's one why I give you quizzes, uh, and I, it, it counts for two uh, two hundred four like two hundred forty uh, points in your out of five hundred or something like that. Anyway, um, so as you are uh, taking the quiz, don't feel like you can't look at your book or you can't review the the uh, your notes from your uh, from your PowerPoint. That's okay. I I just want you to see this information and know this information, or at least possibly remember this information. Uh, it is my own way of, of teaching people. Um, I, there are probably others that do it, but it's not. Uh, most people use quizzes to test people, and I do not. Uh, I expect you to, uh, uh, to look it up if you, if you don't know it. So if you have to look it up, What's the probability you're going to remember it? Well, you've seen the information at least twice, maybe three times. 
So that makes it more likely that you will remember this information. Okay, so I'll uh, talk to you guys next week about uh, Chapter 3, I think, and that's probably all that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, so, adios.